Welcome to freedomlovin.com, where we focus on building freedom in an unfree world. Through personal development, location independence, and passive income strategies. Now here's your host, Kevin Koskella. Welcome back to Freedom Lovin'. This is Kevin, and this is episode number 56. And in just a minute, I have an interview with Taylor White of internationalrealestatelistings.com, and we're going to talk about international real estate listings. So his focus is mostly on the uh, kind of South America, Latin America market, but um, we get into a lot of different topics, and it was an interesting chat. So stay tuned for that. Just have a couple things I wanted to mention beforehand. I did have a, an iTunes review, and it was a negative one, and I won't read the whole thing, but um, basically the person commented that I was whining too much, so I'm, uh, I'm kind of, that's kind of funny. I, I'm interested to see if anyone else thinks that I whine too much on the podcast. Um, usually I have a story, often I have a story towards the beginning of the show, and sometimes it's some struggle that I'm going through, and so trying to just relay something interesting that's happened over the week and how I maybe overcame it, or maybe I didn't, and maybe I'm just, uh, maybe I'm just whining. Love to hear other perspectives. If that's the case, I will try to keep it positive and talk about all the amazing things that are happening instead of uh, the negatives. But some of it is also related to freedom and some of the things that are restricting or attempting to restrict freedom. And so that's kind of what my podcast is about is how to overcome all those things. So, so I don't want to whine. So anyway, let me know about that. And I also, these intros, I try to keep them about five minutes, maybe six minutes long at the most. Sometimes I go a little bit over that, but I don't want to bore people with a bunch of stuff from my life. I want to get the information across, and I don't have anything to sell right now, so it's not. this isn't like a big sales pitch. I just like sharing the information about how to build freedom, and a lot of times that comes down to how to build a business or how to make the right investments or you know that kind of thing to free up your time. So... And just a couple more things uh, before we go on, and I'm, I'm not whining. It's uh, I've been spending some time uh, trying to learn a little bit of Spanish here and there and working on the Duolingo app. And uh, I got some good recommendations uh, last week from a couple of listeners and appreciate that for uh, other resources to learn languages. And I think the best way, of course, is just to immerse yourself in it. And it's really tough because it's just so easy to default to English all the time. And then you kind of lose, even like a few months ago when I was learning a little bit on Duolingo, I noticed I've forgotten some of the words. So it's uh, it's just practice. So anyway, uh, Duolingo, if anyone has a comment on that, I'd love to hear about that. It's festival time in San Diego right now, and it is just busy all the time. So it's the good side and the bad side of living in a really cool city and uh, in a really cool part of the country is that there are so many temptations to do all kinds of things. And mostly the weekends are just nonstop for me. And it wasn't that way in Austin. So, uh, and that was one thing. I mean, I had plenty to do in Austin, but it was definitely more, I could focus more, especially on Sundays. I was doing a lot of work. Now I'm trying to squeeze in work with uh, different festivals, different hanging out with people and doing all sorts of outdoor activities. So good and bad. I'm not whining. (laughs) Let's see. Oh, I did a a little bit of a collage on Facebook, and I just put up a bunch of pictures of the growth in downtown San Diego. So if anyone's interested in that, I know that a lot of people live all over the world and probably have no interest at all. But just in case you are, just friend me on Facebook, and you can see those pictures. There's a lot of new buildings going up here, and new restaurants, new coffee shops, bars. Uh, it's a really good time to be here. And it's interesting because some people ask, how is it growing? Like, What's going on there? And there's just a lot of things, I think, that are happening. Happening. I mean, it got San Diego got ranked in Forbes as the number one place for startups in the U.S., which is probably a little bit of a stretch, but I think it's brought a lot of attention, and there's a lot of people moving here to downtown, and there's a one big company, Semper Energy, which is moving to East Village, which is just downtown, basically, and so there are some things happening here, and it's kind of exciting to see that and be a part of it. So anyway, I wanted to document that. And then one more thing. I downloaded uh, two days ago, I downloaded the One Second Every Day app. And I'm curious if anyone else out there has 
played around with this. It's just basically you take videos during the day with this app, and then you can just pick out one second that you like, like whatever your highlight is of, of that day. And you just do that every day. And then at, at the end of whatever time you want, like at the end of a year or something, you have 365 seconds and it, it turns it into a video, like all played together. So it's kind of cool way to just document your life and everything. So that is that. And then one last thing, and we'll get on to the interview. Uh, I'm considering doing New Year's Eve in that time, around that time in Panama, Panama City. And I've heard just so many amazing things about it. And it's nice to kind of escape winter. And just curious if anyone out there is interested in joining me. I've got a few people that are that I've talked to that are interested. And it'd be great to get some freedom-loving people down there and hang out and maybe uh, do a little mastermind group or something. So, Anyway, let me know about that. Just shoot me an email, kevin at uh, freedomlovin.com. And without further ado, here is my interview with Taylor White. Have a great week and go out there and build some freedom. All right. Well, I'm super excited to have Taylor White on the show today. Taylor has been involved in real estate since the age of 22 has bought and sold real estate in five countries and has been living overseas full-time since the age of 27. He's the host of the number one rated Overseas Property Insider podcast with listeners in over 80 countries and has spoken with the likes of the president of the world's largest house-sitting site, the senior vice president of the number one vacation rental marketplace, president of the premier self-directed 401k company, and dozens of House Hunters International and Live Here by This alums from all over the globe. And his website is internationalrealestatelistings.com. Taylor, welcome to Freedom Loving. Kevin, what is going on, buddy? Kind of a tongue twister, but I'm excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was really excited to get an email from you like maybe a month ago uh, about your site. I, I didn't know about you before, but um, I'm not even sure how we connected, but it, it's just a perfect fit for people that are listening to this show and want to do some traveling and want to get out there and, and you know make passive income and, and things like that. So Yeah, man. I think it goes hand in hand and I reached out to you because I know that on your show, you've had a lot of awesome people like Andrew Henderson, I think maybe even Dan from the Tropical MBA. And you also gave some shout outs this past week from clips from like James Alshisher, of course, Simon Black from Sovereign Man. So I think a lot of what we believe and do kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so you're one of these globe-trotting digital nomad kind of uh, location independent types, right? That sounds very sexy, Kevin. And I'm going to go with what you just said because it sounds so much better. <laughs> yeah, I was actually in a comment thread on Facebook talking about all the buzzwords going around that everybody hates, that's uh, starting to hate. And one of them is digital nomad. That's that's the one that's uh, starting to irritate people. So, <laughs> hey, Kevin, I'll throw a couple out. We got digital nomad. We got lifestyle entrepreneur. Yeah. We have. I guess there could be several that oh, yeah. go. But yeah, I think sometimes there's a couple of catchphrases or buzzwords that people like to use over and over and <laughs> over to the point where you just kind of want to punch yourself in the face. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I try to I try to stay away from them, but then sometimes they slip in. I like boom. I, for some reason, that one uh, kind of works for me. But <laughs> boom, I like boom, my friend. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, so what is your background? So how did you get interested in kind of breaking free of the kind of corporate world and, and doing your own thing and, and traveling and living abroad? Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. Born and raised in sunny San Diego, California, to an awesome entrepreneurial father and a hardworking mother as a teacher. And I had an awesome childhood, working hard, going to school, playing sports. I dropped out of my freshman year in a private university, and I wanted to make some money. My dad was entrepreneurial, and I wanted to get out there, Kevin, and make some money. So I kind of bounced around in the entrepreneurial spirit a little bit. I sold used cars, if you can believe it. I cleaned uh, pools as as a pool boy for some rich and famous people in San Diego. But for me, you know, I didn't want to clean those pools. I wanted to maybe have the house that these people had. So that started my process, Kevin, into real estate. And I started in San Diego. I got my real estate license and broker's license. But for the most part, I was buying and selling my own places. So place by place, place by place. And this happened shortly after September 11th, 2001. And then during those couple of years, Kevin, I got the travel bug. So I started to travel a little bit to amazing spots, the Thailands and the Philippines and the Vietnams and Argentina and Brazil and all these amazing spots. And I said, okay, there's real estate everywhere. I like to travel. How can I combine these? So that's what I've done. 
Yeah, that is awesome. How did you figure out, like, I mean, it, that's a tough jump to make from kind of living in San Diego and, you know, you're probably making decent money and, and living in a great place and then going, okay, I'm just going to like bounce to Thailand or something. Like, how were you able to mentally get there? Were you reading a lot? Were you uh, studying any specific online podcasts or newsletters or anything like that? Yeah, of course. I'm sure you're going to know some of these names. There's only a few people that know these names, but I'm sure you might, Kevin. If we're talking about the overseas niche, you know, his names like Dr. W.G. Hill or the fictitious grandpa character or Uncle Harry Schultz, it, they talked about this awesome life overseas. If we're talking about real estate stuff, it's guys like Robert Allen or Robert Kiyosaki. Of course, it's people today like the uh, Simon Blacks or the Andrew. Henderson's or Kathleen Petticord and Leif Simon at Live and Invest Overseas. But for me, I got my started buying and selling in San Diego, and I made my first overseas purchase. Actually, when I was living in San Diego, Kevin, I went to a Live and Invest Overseas type of conference in San Diego where I met a husband and wife real estate team from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Mm-hmm. Sight unseen, I made my first pre-construction apartment purchase, which of course is silly now. I definitely wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> but that's how I got my star into it. And what really helped me quite a bit, Kevin, is that I met a lot of like-minded entrepreneurs. So I would attend conferences in foreign countries, in places like Buenos Aires or in Montevideo in Uruguay or in Panama City, Panama, also like in Managua, Nicaragua. But I would attend these conferences where there was a lot of like-minded people at these conferences, whether it was for real estate or for second citizenships or passports or bank accounts or just travelers or our favorite word, word digital nomads who are making a living online while traveling the world. And I said, I got to do that. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah, that is awesome. That is really cool. So before we get into kind of the nuts and bolts and how to do all this stuff and and your experience, what can you tell us about, or you can tell me about your favorite experiences traveling, like maybe your top three places or just different experiences that you've had? Yeah, I've been spending a lot of my time in Latin America because I've bought real estate here. I've been seeking legal residency and second citizenships and opening bank accounts and those kinds of things. But to be honest with you, Kevin, my first love is Southeast Asia. And one experience for me that really sticks out, I believe it was my first overseas travel experience coming from San Diego, of course, besides going to like Tijuana or like Ensenada or (laughs) or like Rosarito, those kind of don't count, Kevin. But for me, it was Bangkok, Thailand. It was, you know, flying into Bangkok. It's hot, it's humid, it's congested. It's loud. It's noisy. There's smells. There's noises. It's in your face. So for me, at the age of 22 or 23, whatever it was at the time, that really opened my eyes like, wow, there are some really cool spots. So maybe in Thailand, like the Bangkok or Chiang Mai or Koh Samui, of course, in the Philippines, like Boracay, it's really tough to beat a beach, like in Boracay. Some other awesome spots would be like Medellin in Colombia. It's fantastic. Right now, I'm I'm in the Dominican Republic in a little surferman's village called Las Terrenas. And then, Kevin, I know I am looking at your blog, one spot that you've been that I don't hear too many people talking about besides Machu Picchu, and that's Peru. In Lima, Peru, I think there's an amazing community there, and especially around like Miraflores, yep. there's some awesome spots in Lima. But, Kevin, there's a lot of amazing places. I think it just all depends which spots might might speak to you. Yeah, exactly. And I'm glad you mentioned Medellin because I'm going to be going there in about four weeks. So I'm going to hear about that. But um, but I want to ask you a little bit about why should anyone be looking at overseas real estate opportunities? And what's like someone that's that's kind of like living in, let's say, the US or the UK or something, and they're kind of building up an online business or they they have a job and they want to break out. What's the advantage of, of looking at overseas opportunities in real estate? Yeah, Kevin, I think that's a great question. And First off, you know, we've used the word digital nomad. And if you have real estate, which is kind of brick and mortar, it's not really lending to the digital life, so to speak. So you maybe not be able to travel quite as much as you might be if you write ebooks or have online conferences or podcasts or a website or sell courses to where you can do it any place that you have internet. But if we're going overseas, one of the things that we like that I know Andrew has talked about quite a bit is diversification. So 
you might want to have real estate in one country. You might have a bank account in some place else. It's that old flag theory idea. You know, on my show, I've had Edmund John from Flag Theory, who breaks down the three flags or the five flags or the six flags now to diversify yourself. But if we're talking about real estate, we all need some place to live. And if you want to stick in a location for longer than a few weeks or a few months, it might make sense once you have checked out a few spots and that's to buy real estate. You know, I speak with a lot of house owners international and live here by this lums from all over the place. And the fact of the matter is there's a lot of amazing opportunities. And one of the ways to make money overseas is through real estate. Okay. Okay. So what about the idea of just having kind of a backup plan? Like that's, that's one thing that I used to, I got into this uh, years ago reading like the Agora Financial Group. You know, they have a lot of uh, information on, uh, of course. Invest, you know, moving overseas, moving to South America, moving to Panama. And, and it was more about like gaining citizenship or gaining residency, just, you know, just as a backup plan. Like what if the U.S. doesn't work out? What if something really bad happens here? What do you think about that? Like, is that a good reason to, to be looking at moving and, What's a good place to look there in that case? Yeah, Agora Inc. I don't know if you know this, Kevin, but they own like almost every single online financial newsletter. They own them all. Of course, they have international living and they have numerous other ones that they have. Yeah, you know, for me, how it started was real estate, of course, is how I make my money, but it was just like you as a just in in case plan. What if I'm born in the US and something were to happen and I need to go someplace else? It might make sense if I set up legal residency someplace else. Mm -hmm. We've always heard things like the dollar might go to zero or currencies might go to zero. So what if we had our money outside of our home country in case the government might want to take it? Or let's say that we have our money in the US dollar and we might want to diversify into other currencies, or maybe it's other countries and other bank accounts, or maybe it's a different entity, or maybe, of course, it's seeking legal residency, which means that life as a PT or passing through is fantastic. But what if you need to go someplace for longer than a few weeks or a few months or whatever your tourist visa says, and you need to live there full time? How can you do that? And then, of course, another step would have been to, okay, if I have legal residency, What if I get a second citizenship someplace? So, yeah, I've been definitely been doing all of those. You know, I talk about real estate, but I don't talk about real estate a lot because it's not something that works for everybody. It definitely doesn't lend into this digital nomadic thinking. If you have real estate, you have property taxes, you have tenants if you're going to rent it out, you have all these carrying costs and your money's tied up into it. So there's a lot of other things that go involved with diversification. Right, right. Okay. So I guess what we're talking about is that there's just different goals out there. Like there's people that want to buy real estate so that they can live over, you know, in some other, in another country. And then there's people that want to just invest and want to have their place rented out all year round and make passive income, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one method would be if you're going to live someplace for an extended period of time and you might have the cash, then you might buy a place. One easy way of buying a place might be that you want to buy it undervalued. Of course, if you want it for passive income, then you might get it as a vacation rental. You know, when I first started, or actually not even many years ago, 5, 10, 15 years ago, there wasn't great vacation rental websites that could help you rent out. Sites like HomeAway and VRBO, of course, Airbnb, Dwellable a lot of these fantastic sites that help you facilitate if you have real estate, how can I rent it out? Then, of course, you could use things like property management as well to rent it out. So I think there's a lot of opportunities involved in real estate, whether you want to live in it full time, whether you want to live in it you know, for a few months out of the year and then rent it out, or whether you want to target things like trying to buy something under value so then you can turn around and maybe sell it for a profit. Right. So where are the opportunities now in both areas? Where are there some opportunities to live and then where are the opportunities and become a resident, become a citizen? And then as far as investing goes, where do you see the trends going? Yeah, that's a big loaded question, Kevin. And I think it also depends where you're coming from. So I'm from the States. I've traveled extensively throughout Latin America. I've traveled a little bit in Southeast Asia. I've never been to Europe. So I like to talk about places that I've personally bought and sold real estate or open bank accounts and done those kinds of things. But number one, you know, I know that we always get caught up in this grass is greener. Where is it hot right now? What's going to be hot right now? And for me, I've done that. 
but I think it's more important to first, why don't we develop some strategies, some tactics that will work wherever we go? You right. know, there's a, a an author that's very famous in U.S. real estate, Robert Allen, who's written many, many books. I've read his books. I've gone to his conferences. But there's one thing that really stands out, Kevin, about Robert that I really like. And he had this challenge. He probably still does. He had it 15, 20, 25 years ago. And it was this. He could go to any city in any state in the U.S. or to any country. And based on specific strategies that he's developed, he could locate great deals and make money from those deals. So instead of saying, okay, where's it hot? Where's it hot? Because, Kevin, I could tell you, well, Playas, Ecuador, it's really hot. It's a path of progress. They're putting in new roads and highways and infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. But then you're going to say, Taylor, but I don't know anything about Playas, Ecuador. And I said, that's absolutely right. So I think it's first important to find areas that you like. When you're in those areas, make great connections. If it's about real estate, then you want to meet with several different real estate agents. You might want to meet with different lawyers. You're going to want to meet with other investors who are doing exactly what you want to do so you can better understand how things work. Then you want to look at real estate. You want to see what things are selling for. You want to see if people are actually buying and selling or if they're buying and renting out or if it's just being publicized that everybody's going there. But once you get there, you're like, oh, wow, all the stuff that I've been reading is actually wrong. It might have been hot a couple of years ago go, but it's not. Thankfully, I didn't invest in it. So that's why sometimes getting caught up with this what's hot now or this grass is greener for real estate doesn't necessarily make sense and instead work on some strategies and tactics that you can take with you wherever you go. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. I, I think it would be really tough to just pick a place and land there and then just say, okay, this is it. I, everyone's telling me to buy in Chile, so I'm going to buy in Chile. And uh, I think that could run in, you could run into some problems there, but yeah, go Kevin, ahead. Charlotte, you know, sorry if you don't mind, because I know I didn't say like any locations. You just said Chile, of course. And it's funny. I mean, when someone says a location like Chile, that's almost like saying, hey, Kevin, where they say, hey, where's a great spot to invest? And I say, oh, go to the U.S. Well, yeah. U.S. is a huge country, <laughs> exactly. right? It's like what state, what region, what city, what neighborhoods, what streets are you talking about? So that's why if you say Chile, yeah. And then, of course, it's like, well, who does it make sense for? Does it make sense for the people that got early investment? investors together that bought big plots of land and then they're subdividing it now, well, it might not make sense financially for you to buy it from them because they got in at the great deals, right? So I think it all really depends. But some great spots, let's say in Latin America, some spots that I really like would be like Panama City, Panama, Medellin, Colombia, of course. I really like different spots around Lima, Peru, like in Miraflores. I have um, experience around Fortaleza, Brazil. So I think there's a lot of great areas, but it all depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for a fantastic beach, of course, it's not going to be Panama City. If you're looking for the mountains, then it won't be the city. If you're looking to spend there for a long period of time, then it all depends. So there's so much that goes into it versus just where should I buy because a lot depends on it. Right, right. Okay, so then just to kind of narrow it down a little bit, what about – can you can you talk about some places that may be overrated and a little getting a little bit too much exposure, and then some places that maybe are underrated, in ter- in terms of uh, you know Latin America and the areas that you've you're focused on. Yeah, Kevin, absolutely. You know, there's been one area that's hugely promoted, and that's just the country of Brazil. If we're looking in Latin America and areas like Fortaleza or Rio or Sao Paulo, a lot of these areas have been promoted. The one thing about Brazil, and I've bought and sold in Fortaleza, Brazil, so I understand this. I've spent a lot of time in Fortaleza. Real estate is tough. It's tough whether you buy in your own city, in your own language, with the own people that you know. So once you go to a different state or a different country or different languages, I think it really adds to the confusion. So one area, one country that I think is overrated if you're looking in Latin America is Brazil for many reasons. One, they speak Portuguese. It's not Spanish. Another one, I don't know if you ever traveled to Brazil. It's very hard to fly into Brazil, get out of Brazil without spending an absolute fortune in plane tickets. And just your cost of real estate, I think, in Brazil is very, very tough. You know, I've bought and sold in markets like Buenos Aires in Argentina, in Fortaleza, Brazil, coastal in Nicaragua, and a lot of different spots around Panama City, Panama. 
Yeah. Now I'm actually going. So just to kind of a selfishly, I want to find out a little more about. I'm, I told you I'm going to Colombia in about a month, and I'll be in Cartagena and Medellin. So I'm really curious because I actually part of the reason of going originally is that my friend and I were going to go look at some real estate. And so that's another reason why I wanted you on the podcast because I wanted to, wanted to find out about these areas. And I, I noticed that you had someone uh, on your podcast that was a, a specialist in Cartagena. And so I'm, I'm really curious about what your opinion is about, about those areas and what the pluses and minuses might be. And then also with Panama City, I've just recently heard a lot about it and how it's really a neat place. And uh, I want to visit there in a couple months as well. Yeah, that's where I, I really got my start was in Panama City, moved there full time as my home base. Actually, I know the date, March 15th, 2007. So I really like around Panama City. If you're looking at buying and selling real estate or buying to rent out real estate, you've also talked about Colombia. I spent quite a bit of time in Medellin as well as a little bit in Cartagena. I, I'm not a big fan. You know, I know in Latin America, the walled cities are popular where things cost a lot more. It's always hot and humid. It's kind of hot and sexy. I know in the Dominican Republic and Santo Domingo, we have the old colonial zone as well. I'm not necessarily in Panama. Of course, there's Casco Viejo and, and there's a lot of them in Latin America. I'm not necessarily a personal big fan. I always think that they're overpriced. I always think that involves in real estate, they always have to be done up to how the, the places were in the 1800s or the early 1900s. Oh, yeah. There's like limited inventory. But one spot that you mentioned, which is fantastic, is a place like Medellin. Of course, if we're talking about real estate, I think one of the great areas is around Parque Yeras, of course, or the El Poblado, you know, big hill that's overlooking in like Medellin. And that's an area that I really like, and I think that you're going to find a lot there that you're going to like. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know. That's good to. Uh, I'll definitely. I was. I was kind of leaning towards Cartagena, but um, but it sounds like Medellin might be a little bit better for. <laughs> well, for me personally, I love Medellin. It's green. It's beautiful. It's in the mountains, so it's not quite as hot and humid. I think a lot of times. It's well, it depends in the expat community like Medellin is being talked about all over the place. But if you're not involved in those communities, you probably haven't heard too much about like Medellin, Colombia. Cartagena is kind of hot. It's kind of humid. It's coastal. So if that's something that you like, kind of hot and sexy, that works as well. I know in Panama City, there's Casco Viejo, which is just like a, a Cartagena as well. A lot of Latin American countries have those areas. But Medellin is just there's so much, Kevin, to like about Medellin. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to go down there and, and check it out. In general, what strategies and advantages do you see in the Latin America market? Like, what should people be looking for, looking at, and and why Latin America? Like, I know you're really into, in, you know, you're you're really big, a big fan of that area. I'm sure you know Spanish and and that kind of thing. But why else should people be looking there? I think there's a lot to like about Latin America. You know, if you're coming from the States or Canada, one of the obvious reasons why most people are looking at Mexico or Belize or Costa Rica or Panama is because it's close to where they're coming from or the Bahamas, of course. So one of the reasons why Latin America is so big, especially Central America versus place in Southern Latin America, like Uruguay or Argentina or Chile, is for the simple fact that it's close. Mm -hmm. So I think that plays a roll into it. You know, if you're looking in Central America, a place like Panama City, as a for instance, or like Medellin, I think one great avenue that you can target as a real estate investor is to target out of country owners. You know, I know that there's a lot of people that say that aren't involved in real estate who talk about real estate who say that you should buy from a local and sell to a foreigner. And I think that's completely wrong. Where you find your great deals is when you are on the ground. Of course, you understand values. You meet a lot of real estate agents. You go see a lot of property. But one of the reasons why targeting out-of-country sellers is so important is because if they're from the States or Canada, that's where they're probably living. They have their primary residence. They were buying a vacation rental maybe in these locations that I'm talking about. Maybe they're going to live there a few months out of the year. But their financial situation has changed, right? They lost their job or they're not making as much money or someone died or they're getting divorced or they're in the hospital, all the reasons why, why you can find great deals in real estate. And if you target out-of-country sellers in these markets, I find that that's when you can walk into great deals. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's a really great point. I think that that kind of helps narrow it down and kind of gives some good strategies on on what to do when you get there. So you're you're suggesting that people never buy sight unseen, right? You definitely go down there, meet people, check it out, everything like that. Yeah, Kevin, I know it sounds sexy. The the one thing that we need to keep in mind with real estate is it's not like a stock. You can go online, you can push buy and sell on E-Trade, and you can buy and sell something very, very quickly. Real estate is not like that. It takes a lot more money. There's a lot more carrying costs. There's a lot more cost involved. There's a lot more obstacles involved. You know, I definitely don't recommend anybody buying real estate in a country they've never been or a city that they've never been or if they personally haven't been on the ground before because how do you know if something's a great deal? You, like you might get an email newsletter or you might be on a teleconference or whatever – and someone's telling you, hey, there's this great deal for 150000 or 100000 but you don't really know. You're taking one person's advice. Well, what if that person is wrong? What if you've never met other agents? What if you haven't been on the ground? What if they're telling you that this is oceanfront, but really you know it's city view? Or what if they're promoting a development from a out-of-country developer, but it's never going to get developed, and your money's going to be tied into that development for years and years and years to come because they can't get it completed. You know, I think it's very, very important, and that's why I always say, you know, boots on the ground. I know people like to say that, especially true for real estate. So slow down a little bit, pick a few locations that you might want to spend time in, and get in those locations. Meet agents. Understand how much things cost understand how much things might rent out for, and really understand what you might buy it for, what you might sell it for, what you might rent it for, how you might rent it. Understand all those things first, so your exit strategy before you ever buy anything. Okay, great. And is it necessary to know Spanish if you're going to be investing in the Latin American market? It's not 100% mandatory. It definitely helps. Of course, speaking the language, you know, it's like being in the States and not speaking English, (laughs) trying to understand all the ins and outs is is not quite the same. Is it 100% mandatory to be fluent? No, it's not because you can deal with English speaking agents, English speaking lawyers. Of course, you would have the contract translated, let's say from Spanish to English anyways. So it definitely helps to be at least conversational, but you definitely don't need to be fluent. Okay, yeah, because I, I used to be a real estate investor in the U.S. and Texas mostly, and, and a little bit in Utah and Idaho. And we, one of the things that I was looking at was investing something like in Mexico and things like that. And people were telling me that you can do it. You can you can hire you can have people that interpret things for you and all that. It's no problem, but uh, it's a, it's easier if you actually know the language because then. Like a lot of things get misinterpreted and then all of a sudden you're buying something you didn't realize and there's something in the contract that, that just got overlooked and things like that that seemed to – that kind of scared me off from, from going there. I, my Spanish is really pretty pathetic at this point. So, Yeah, but Kevin, to be honest with you, let's say that when you're like in, in like Medellin, you want to meet some agents. But you can meet like English-speaking agents. There's a lot of agents now, especially in Medellin that come from the States or Canada, of course, you can buy from English speaking owners. Of course, you can deal with lawyers that speak English and you're going to have the the contract translated anyways. So really, if you want to infiltrate yourself with only English speakers, it's definitely possible. And I think 95% of the people in Latin America do that anyways. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. I didn't know this. I I would have thought that you you had to be fluent. So uh, now how does financing work? Can you explain that? Yeah, well, if we're talking about financing, number one, I think it's better if you can get financing from your home country, let's say the States or Canada. But if you can't get home financing, and we can look in certain regions like in Latin America. I know in Central America, countries like Belize, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, there's banks like Key Bank, which is based out of Belize, that will do mortgage loans in those countries. In countries like Panama, where I've done a lot of business buying and selling my own stuff, you can still get mortgage loans as a foreigner. You know, a lot of countries either don't have mortgages or as an expat, you might not be able to qualify for a mortgage. So that might not be a possibility. But one thing that you can do is get developer financing. So let's say that you're going to buy from a developer, whether it's a housing development or a condo tower, a lot of the developers will offer developer stage payments. So you might be able to put down a certain percent down and a certain percent per month based on the construction period. 
of course, if we're talking about buying direct from a seller, a lot of expats now, especially if they're dealing with expat real estate agents that understand this, do seller financing. So you might be able to buy from a seller, let's say putting down a little bit more money, 20%, 30%, 40% down, but the seller might carry back some seller financing. So there's a lot of expats now that have, that offer seller financing. If they're coming from Canada or the States as a for instance, where there's some seller financing, they understand the ins and outs a little bit. Especially if you deal with an expat real estate agent, you can get seller financing. So you're buying directly from a seller. You might put down 20, 30, or 40 percent, and they might carry back part of the loan. So it's not like you have to come in with 100 percent cash. But of course, if you have the money, that's how you can find better deals. That's how you can walk into the better deals. Is you look at a lot of different real estate, you understand what the values are, and you just simply offer less. And the owners that say, yes, you walk into a good deal. Yes, you have to look at more property. Yes, you have to make more offers. Yes, you have to work with more real estate agents. A lot of people might not like you. That's okay because the one property that says, yes, you're walking into a great deal. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, it sounds like it's a little more kind of wild west down there than it is uh, up here in the States where everything's very, very formal and that kind of thing, right? Well, yeah, there's one thing about the states. It's not – your house isn't really worth what you can sell it for, right? Your house is worth what the appraiser says it's worth based on the last three to four four comparables in your direct neighborhood. And it's always the, the lowest comparables. And if you had someone that had a foreclosure or they had to walk away, then it dream, brings down the values, et cetera. One of the reasons why I like targeting overseas sellers – in places like Panama and, and like Colombia is because they probably paid cash. So they have more room to negotiate. Mm-hmm. So it's easier to possibly find great deals in those jurisdictions. Yeah, and I imagine there's less people to deal with in an intera- in a, uh, interaction when you're, when you're actually selling the property or buying the property. Like I just sold a house in Texas a month ago, and it was a, kind of a nightmare. I mean, I, there, were so many, <laughs> there were so many things that went wrong, and there were so many different levels of, you know, there's the, the lenders, there's the title company, there's the realtors, there's, we had so the many appraiser. people involved. And I, you know, I was going around and around with all these people and returning, you know, trying to, trying to talk to different people about different issues. And then uh, I actually talked to the buyer at one point, which is, <laughs> in most, most of the time, you never, the seller never even talks to the buyer. That's just like unheard of here because. That's why you have the real estate agent, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And that was getting really frustrating. We finally had to talk because there was like there was some stuff that was happening that we both wanted to close but that we weren't able to. So we had to we had to work something out ourselves. And um, anyway, that that's well, that sounds like it's something that's not as much of an issue down there. Well, Kevin, I Actually, no. I mean, I would say real estate is kind of the same whether you're doing it in Texas or California or if you go overseas. Some of those same things. That's why, you know, buying and selling real estate or buying real estate to rent out in foreign countries and different languages and different cultures. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. But so I don't think those obstacles just because you go to a different country, if anything, they're going to be more, not less. You, you probably have more people to pay off, too, I imagine. Well, it's not necessarily that, but one of the obstacles that you might not have is the financing thing. So that's why, you know, sometimes it's hard – well, not sometimes. A lot of times it's hard to find, quote, unquote, great deals in the States. Yeah. One of the reasons is because everybody has financing. Not only do they have financing, they have financing at 90 percent or 80 percent or 7 percent of their home's value. So by the time you back out all the costs, you can't really, for the most part, buy, quote, unquote, great deals unless you target out of state sellers or unless you target couples that got divorced or someone died or if a house was paid off. So that's why when you go overseas, and I'm going back to that overseas seller thing, that you can target these sellers because they probably paid cash. They're probably not living in it. They probably had something happen in their lives where they would gladly take selling it to you at a discount if they can just get rid of that and return back to their life. Right, right. Cool. So we've covered quite a bit here with real estate and Latin America markets. And what else can you tell someone that's listening that's interested in this and interested in buying and interested in in investing and possibly moving uh, somewhere, Panama, Colombia, somewhere down there? Yeah, definitely. One of the things I think is to tread slow and go step by step. You know, just because I talk about real estate, I definitely don't recommend anybody buying something sight unseen or taking someone's hot 
pick on a certain market, first go to that area and see if you like it or not. Maybe, you know, I've talked about Panama. Maybe Panama might be okay, but you don't like Panama City. That's okay. You can go to a beach area called Coronado, or you might go to the mountains of Boquete, or we're talking about Colombia. Maybe you actually don't like Medellin because you don't like the weather there because it rains a little bit and it's a little cooler. Maybe you do like Cartagena. That's fine. So go to an area first. Don't get locked into a long-term lease or don't do something silly like go to a conference, have some cocktails, meet some people, and before you know it, you're signing a contract to buy something. Take your time. Go someplace. See if you like it. If you can do it, visit that location when it's good and when it's bad. Maybe if you're in Central America, you can't handle when it's really hot or you can't handle the rainy season. That's why it's not a big deal. If you don't have a long-term lease, you can walk away. Or if you haven't signed a contract, you can just walk away and try something else. So one of the big takeaways, I think, even though we're talking about real estate and buying real estate and some basic strategies, is just take it slow. Okay. Great, great stuff. Now, so how did you end up in uh, Dominican Republic and what's going on there? Are you excited about the area or how long do you plan to stay? Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. Just like we're talking about, one of the strategies that I wanted to do was get legal residency in a second citizenship someplace else. Mm -hmm. I tried it in my home base in Panama. Didn't work out so well. Tried it over a couple of years in Uruguay. Didn't work out so well. So during that time, I've also been doing it in the Dominican Republic. So besides the fact that I really like the Dominican Republic, I think it has a lot to offer. Primarily, I am have been in the DR for the last several years on and off because I'm I have a legal residency and I'm seeking my uh, second citizenship here. Okay. Yeah. And it's not far, right? I mean, you can easily get back to the States and, and it's, it's relatively easy to live there, I imagine. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, really, the DR is a couple hour flight from Florida. You're about two and a half hour flight from Panama City in Panama or San Jose, Costa Rica or like Medellin. So it's pretty central. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Actually, I had a, a deal. I was working with one of my websites. I basically teach swimming and I was going to work with somebody in the Dominican Republic that was going to help me op open up to the Latin America market and uh, starting starting there. And I actually was almost I was going to go there in May, and it just kind of fell through. But but yeah, I'll talk to you if, I, if that happens again, which should be this winter. Uh, I'll I'll give you a, a shout and find out what the good areas to go visit are. You know, one of the areas of – well, one of the things about the DR that I really like is it has amazing weather. Having a home base in Panama City or different spots in Panama, it's pretty hot and humid, pretty congested like in Panama City. It's the concrete jungle, if you will. But the DR, of course, it's an island, so it has beautiful weather, and there are some great spots. It's not all Punta Cana, which is kind of like the Cancun-esque of like Mexico, of high towers and everything so expensive. There's a lot of other areas outside of places like Punta Cana, like right now I'm in – Los Terrenas, which is a couple hour drive from Santo Domingo, but it's a pretty quiet fisherman's village where you can, where there's great weather, there's awesome beaches. So there's a lot of things to like. Awesome. Taylor, it's been great having you on the show. It's been really interesting hearing about uh, what you're doing and all the opportunities out there in real estate. Do you have anything else you want to add before we kind of close it out here? No, I think we've covered things pretty well. One of the things when we talk about this overseas niche too, a lot of it is there's a book that I really like, Kevin, that is a good quote. It's a good book. It's Michael Masterson's Ready, Fire, Aim. It came out, I don't know, five to seven years ago now. But you know, we're talking about this overseas niche, and we're talking about due diligence and podcasts and online conferences and conferences. That's our ready aspect. And our fire aspect, Kevin, is getting started. It doesn't have to be quick, but at some point, we have to get started. And then our aim comes into, well, we meet a few different people. We see what they're doing. Doing, we might meet, uh, go to some conferences, and that's when our aim comes in. So that ready, fire aim, I think, is really important in anything that we do, especially if it involves the overseas niche. Awesome. Yeah, I've heard about that book. I've heard really good things. I have to put it on the list for sure. So yeah, and if someone wants to do this, uh, are you someone that can kind of help them and guide them along and, and uh, help them get started here? Yeah, absolutely. My main website is internationalrealestatelistings.com. From there, you can easily find my Overseas Property Insider podcast, something around 150 live episodes in the last eight or nine months where I speak with on-the-ground insiders in places that we're talking about, vacation rental insiders. So I'm not just there speaking about all the things I think I know. I'm actually speaking with the people that are on the ground that are actually doing it themselves. And I also think that's a great resource. 
Awesome. Yeah, I highly recommend Taylor's podcast. Uh, it's it's a great resource. It's a great get a feel for if this is something you want to do. I would check out some of the episodes and uh, just dig in there. So, uh, again, Taylor, thanks for coming on and good luck with everything you're doing. Awesome, Kevin. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Freedom Lovin' Podcast. To break free today, head on over to freedomlovin.com. <laughs> And download our free guide, Seven Practical Tips to Living Free in an Unfree World. <laughs>